The following video is a recording of a lecture from Genes to Galaxies, the 35th Professor Harry Messel International Science School, presented to high achieving Year 11 and 12 students from across Australia and 10 other countries. It's nice to be back, uh, and, and I'm going to talk about, um, yes, part two of gene silencing. Um, you may remember we talked about it, about, a bit about it uh, last week. Unfortunately, some of the, you're, you're not going to get to see some of the um, movies, but never mind. Uh, we'll get to some of them, I hope. So you may remember uh, look, last week we were talking about silent, how to silence a gene, and the idea was to silence to stop the protein of a gene being made, what we were doing is we were targeting the messenger RNA. And the, the way, in fact, that was operating was because we found that there was a pathway in, um, in all cells, that, or all eukaryotic cells, that recognized double-stranded RNA and cut it and then use it in a way to, to um, degrade single-stranded RNA. And this was a, a virus defense pathway. And then you, hopefully you will remember also that um, we use this as a way to silence all sorts of different genes in plants using these hairpin RNAs which mimicked double-stranded RNA and therefore we, in this case we targeted a, um, uh, the pigment gene of this, of this seed which is brown and so we killed that off so that seeds would now from plants containing this trans gene would, would grow uh, yellow seed. So what I'd like to talk about today is actually more of the, the mechanism that's going on and how the further we looked into it, the more amazing it became. And then I'd like to finish off with showing you some really weird stuff, I hope, <laughs> some movies of some really weird stuff that, that might be um, uh, of, of great application all over the place. But first I'd like to talk about these um, proteins, the Dicer and the Argonauts, which are, which are doing this process of, um, of, of killing off RNAs and silencing genes. And so you know, hopefully you will remember this is, I think, my last slide from last week, which is that this is the nucleus and these things here are the, are the Dicers, um, which recognize double-stranded RNA. So when you put in the double-stranded RNA, it will recognize double-stranded RNA, cut it up into these small uh, pieces. Um, and if we focus on just one of those, that's just a, a representation of what it really is doing is it's cutting up it into, into basically into 21s. And, and you'd notice, hopefully, that, that instead of cutting straight across the double-stranded RNA, it actually cuts with, a, with a, a, a zigzag here so that you have these two nucleotides or bases sticking out at this end and these two bases sticking out at the other end of the other strand. And that will become important a little later on. So here we are. This is the 21s. It was cut by Dicer and now being loaded into this Argonaut. So the two proteins I really want to talk about are the Dicer protein and this Argonaut protein. And so what the Argonaut is doing is using one of these strands, as you remember. It's looking at all the single-stranded RNA, finding its match and, and, and cleaving it. And that, so that's what an argonaut does, is it, it cuts RNA when it's found uh, the match for its, its guide strand. And so this is where I was going to show you a nice moving crystal structure and so on, but I don't think it's going to, whoop, a bit higher. OK, is that better? How's that? I'm afraid I'm talking a bit like Barry White at the moment. I've got a cold. But, uh, um, yes, so I had hope. I mean, I'll give it a go and see if it will work just as a miracle. But I, uh, when we tried this before, it didn't work. No, it's not going to work. So uh, you were going to see this crystal structure that we, which we could rotate and move around. But we'll just go with it from this static structure. So this is actually what the dicer looks like. Well, the dicer I've... I showed you before was just a sort of a, 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 a just a just a uh, a sphere almost, or, or, or a circle, diagrammatically. And so, uh, but it really, I guess, the beauty of, of looking at, at proteins now and looking at the structure is you can really see their function. And and what what this 
squiggle around here is this is the protein and this here is the double-stranded RNA. And, and what it's doing is, hope, can you notice that this bit sticks out further uh, than this piece? And that's those two extra bases that stick on, um, stick out once it's been cut. And so once the double-stranded RNA has been cut once, then the next piece has got this sticky end. And what that does is it fits into this pocket here. Again, I was going to try and hopefully show you that this is how it fitted in the pocket. But what it does is that bit sticks in this gap here, and it, it's actually measuring a length from here to up here. And then we have these ions that are trapped here, and then they will cut the, the bonds uh, in the double-stranded RNA at this point and at this point to give you that overhack, that that's jagged cut at the other end. So this is a bit unfortunate because this is also the, the um, I was going to show you the Argonaut structure, which is really rather beautiful too, in that um, what it actually looks like is a cylinder. And this is cut through, halfway cut through um, that cylinder. And this yellow thing here is that 21 base RNA that has come from the dicer, and it sticks there. And it's, if you like, if you imagine a cylinder and it's on the inside of the cylinder, and so it's just sticking there. And that, but only one strand. So every other RNA that's in the cell is going to be passed through this cylinder. And when it, uh, down this rather nice uh, hole down the middle of the cylinder, until it matches here, and then it will cleave. That's a sort of a diagrammatic version of, of it going through this hole. Again, it was going to be here, but it's not. So we'll, we'll just move on. Um, OK. Page down. OK. So you were supposed to be impressed by the beautiful structures there. And now I'm going to um, uh, tell you how, when that was first purified and shown to be a, a dicer that was doing this cleavage, we could, it gave us then tremendous information to go around and look for other dicers in all different uh, species. Because the really great thing about modern biology is that we can sequence, easily determine the sequence of DNA or of RNA and even the, the amino acids of, of a protein. And also, because we know the, uh, the the, the, the code, we can just look at a piece of DNA and know, immediately interpret that if it's a, an, an ATT, that's going to code for the amino acid isoleucine or whatever. So we can read straight off the DNA what the protein amino acid sequence is going to look like. So this gives us um, a, a real way of looking at, uh, uh, at organisms that we've just sequenced and we've never looked at any proteins before. We can just look at the DNA and look at and find a lot of information about various proteins. And just to illustrate that is, you may remember from the first talk, I showed you that YouTube movie and that, the, um, that when the, we looked at the DNA, before it was being um, trans transcribed, turned into RNA, it was being opened up. And the protein that was doing that was, uh, it's called a helicase. It, it sort of open, um, that's the function of this, this uh, enzyme. And so here, here, what I've just shown you is, four different um, helicases, and we know the protein sequences. And so all we've done is bung these in the computer and say, match them up. And then the computer does all this comparison. And hopefully what you can see here is that this is one sequence, and it carries on down here, the sequence two, etc. is that in this region, there is a lot of, of conservation. And so if we just blow that up, it's, it means that all of the helicases have a proline in this position, a, uh, a lysine in this position, a leucine in this one, a glycine, and a spider. Uh, and so you have this motif, P, that's always got a P in that position next to a K. Most of the time, there's a V of aline, then a leucine, and so on. And so you have this conserved motif. And downstream of that, you also have another uh, conserved motif. So that, uh, and it doesn't matter how, having the X's, if it's, uh, which is anything, it's just the, the spacing gives you um, a sort of a, a, a key that tells you that this is what its function is. So that if we could find, a, have a completely unknown sequence and we put it in against this and you, and you suddenly find this motif here, you know that it's going to have 
uh, a helicase or it's got a good chance of having a helicase activity. So, uh, <coughs> a lot, that's a bit of uh, a long way around to, to explain that when the first dicer protein was purified and shown to have this activity, we could look at the sequences and compare it with all the known sequences of all the known um, proteins with, that have function. And we can say that, that at the, the front end of the protein, there's this sequence that tells it's, it's got a helicase function, so the ability to open up uh, DNA or RNA. So that sounds quite a reasonable, I think, attribute to have. And it has these two RNAs, three domains here, which an RNA3 is, a, is a, uh, an enzyme that will cut RNA. And so again, that's a pretty uh, sensible thing for a dicer to have, considering it's going to have to open up double-stranded RNA and, and cut it. And, and then this domain here is a double-stranded RNA binding domain. So again, a usual function you might expect for a, a, a sensible function for a dicer to have. These two other function uh, uh, domains, well, one is called PAS, and I won't go into it. The other one's got rather a nice name of DUF 283, and DUF stands for Domain of Unknown Function. So you, you just name, if you don't know what it, what it does, but you see it often, you just give it a number. So here we know that this is what uh, the first dicer that was ever purified looked like. And if we go and look in plants, we can find that there's a gene that has very, very similar motifs. You can see it's got the helicase, it's got the DUF, it's got the PAS, RNAs3, and in fact it's got two double-stranded <coughs> RNA binding domains. So we're pretty sure that this is going to be um, a dicer. So now having that um, ability to go in and look at uh, genomes and, and find out where there's a, if there's a dicer present, uh, we then went looking at all the sequenced genomes that we, that we have. Um, so the human genome has been sequenced, uh, uh, um, the fruit fly insect genome, uh, there's some fungi that have been sequenced, and, and so on, and a number, of, and a number of, of plants. And what we find is that, that we humans have only got one of these dices, and insects do twice as well as us, they've got two. But plants do best of all, and they have at least a minimum of four different dices. And, and rice has actually got uh, six of these guys. So, uh, and you can see that the dices were still around, were, were there about nearly two billion years ago, when um, you could still, we can still detect them because of the, this common root, that uh, two billion years ago, the, the, the um, the progenitors of these dices were, were, were there. So in, in plants, a, um, I told you that Aravidopsis, which is our sort of mouse, our model plant for, for working on, uh, that there were four different, one, four different dices. And if this is just putting the Aravidopsis ones and the rice ones together, and, what you f and in fact pop poplar, which is a, a, a tree species. And what you find is that, that Rice and Arabidopsis and poplar have one copy of this dicer one or dicer like one gene, and they they each have one copy of the dicer like four gene. But the reason that rice has six copies is it's actually got two copies of dicer like two and two copies of dicer like three. So, in order to have a look and see what's going on in these in these um, uh, with these genes what, that we've got only one and and and. Uh, Arabidopsis has got four. One of the real advantages in working in plants compared to virtually any other um, organism to, for, for basic research is that we have there are about 25,000 genes in Arabidopsis and we have a, a mutation for virtually 75% uh, of these. So we can go and search in a particular gene bank and find a plant which is mutant in just that one gene. And so this is what we've done. And this plant here is just our normal uh, wild-type plant. But here, this plant is mutant just in dicer 2. This one is mutant in just in dicer 3. This is mutant in just in dicer 4. And this little guy is mutant in uh, dicer 1. So you'll see immediately that 2, 3, and 4 are really not that very much different uh, to, um, to the wild type, whereas dicer 1 is, is very different. And what we can do is we can stack these dicers together. So here, this the mutation. So this plant here has mut is mutant for dicer 2 and 3 and 4. 
And again, it looks very much like a, a wild type plant. So um, this is not that surprising, I guess, because as I was telling you in the first uh, talks that, that these dices were, was a virus defense pathway. So you'd think, OK, if you knock out the virus defense pathway, as long as you don't hit the plant with a virus, you're not going to have too much of a, a, of a bad effect upon it. And, and so it's going to look pretty normal as long as there's no virus around. But what we can do, it's, it's as if it, nature has been kind to us poor plant people because we, we need all the help we can get. And so it, it's actually that the dicer that I was telling you that it will cut up just a 21 base piece from double-stranded RNA. Uh, in actual fact, that's only one of these dicers. The others have different sizes. And so if you look at this thing here is a, is a gel, a blot, which the band on here tells you the size. And this is the size of the small RNA that's made from a plant that's been infected with, a, with the virus. And so in the, this wild type plant, we've infected the virus and it's been chopped up into pieces of 21 bases, maybe 22 and 24. But it becomes clearer. If, if we use a double mutant, so it's missing dice of two and dice of three, so the only dice left is dice of four, it's oh, of these three, uh, it's only 21 in size. And here it's mutant in three and four, so it's only got dice of two, and it's 22 in size. And here, missing dice of two and four, so the only dice left is dice of three, and it's 24. Whereas the triple mutant, you'll see there's no small RNAs being made at all. So that's telling you that dice of two and three and four are the things that are munching up your virus, but um, uh, uh, and, but they all have different sizes. So if we look at it like this, here's the double-stranded RNA that you're putting in. It's been cut up into 22s by dice of 2, cut up to 21s by dice of 4, and cut up into 24s by dice of 3. And if for the 4 and 2, they're loading into this argonaut so it can then go and find the virus and chop it up. And same with dice of, dice of 4. And if we, what's nice is to see that, that this is, um, if we go back to the crystal structure, we can see that uh, the size is, is simply determined by the length of this pocket I was going to show you and these ions. So that it's basically just like a ruler here because when we align those different dices, one, two, three, four, et cetera, you can see, hopefully you can see that dicer three here has got an insertion of some extra amino acids in this, at this point, and, an and some insertions from some amino acids here. And all that's really doing is it's taking that pocket that holds this little spiky bit out, and it's, it's just a bit further away from these ions. So it's, it's really just a ruler, and however far away this is from those uh, trapped ions, the, the, the larger the piece you're going to cut. So that's how dice of three is doing, dice of two, three, and four are doing their, their thing. Uh, but interestingly, dice of four, uh, dice of three rather, makes these 24s, and it loads into a cousin of the argonauts I was telling you about, an argonaut four, and it targets DNA, not RNA, and it's actually protecting you or protecting the plant from things like retroviruses, viruses that will go into the genome and they'll be at the DNA level. And this guides Argonaut 4 to do its uh, story. Okay, so hopefully what you'll have thought of is, is, is that, okay, I've said there's a virus defense pathway in the plants, and um, if it's really that good, then you shouldn't be able to infect any plants. They would be all completely protected, that the virus would come in, make its double-stranded RNA, trigger the mechanism, and the Argonauts would, would kill it off. And um, the answer is, is that, that, uh, that um, just like with almost all pathogens, when the host develops some defense mechanism, the pathogen then develops a, a strategy uh, against it. So if we look at this, one of my favorite viruses, potato leaf roll virus, which uh, has a really dramatic effect on your potato crop, and if we just crack it open and, and pull out its RNA and then look at the genes there, then these genes are coat proteins and polymerases and all those sorts of things I talked about before. 
but it's got this extra gene here, which we call ORF0, or the protein, and we call it P0. And this protein is actually the virus's defense against this whole mechanism. And it works in a, in a very, very elegant way, I think, in that what it does is it targets these argonauts and it uh, stops them from working. Because without the argonauts there to cut up the virus, then um, the, the whole defense mechanism is, is useless. It basically has got no, um, no scissors to chop up that virus. But the way in which it does it is, I think, is really very clever too, because in plants and animals and everything, we have this uh, complex, which is called the, uh, what's called the ubiquitination complex. But what it basically does is it recognizes proteins. And so when you have proteins and it's time, they're getting a bit old, it's time to turn them over, there's a, got to be this complex that comes along and sticks a, a label on that protein and says, it's time to be destroyed, to go to the trash bin and, and be destroyed. Or there's some signaling that where you want to destroy a protein. So this is what plants and animals and yeasts and all have to, to, to destroy proteins when it's the right time for them, when, the, when the, the, the cell wants to do it. And the way in which it's guided is it's this, this protein here called an F-box protein, which binds to this receptor here and it also, uh, from one end, and it binds to the target protein at the other end. And so uh, uh, cells have all kinds of different F-boxes, which are just the sort of, in a way, like antibodies or just they, just, they recognize the protein that they want to turn over. And then when it sticks here, this protein sticks on the label that says, please destroy me, onto that protein. <coughs> and then other machinery comes along and, and degrades it. So, the virus being much more elegant than any uh, plant or human which, where we've got 25 or 50,000 genes and it's only got six, it manages to make the host uh, do exactly what it wants. And all it does is it produces this P0 protein which, will recognize, which is recognized by the receptor and this end recognizes argonaut. So it's telling the plant sort of tagging complex to go to the argonauts and stick on a tag which says, please destroy me. And then the plant is actually using its own garbage disposal to get rid of its, its defense mechanism. So to show you that this really does happen, what we've done is we've taken a, a virus and we've tagged it with that GFP gene that I told you about before, which we got from, the, um, uh, from jellyfish. So it fluoresces beautifully in the dark when you shine blue light on it. So this is a leaf where we've just shined, a healthy leaf, where we've just shined this blue light on it in the dark. And you can see there's no, no green there. But here we've infected this leaf now with um, a virus, but it's in, in its genome, in the virus, there's this fluorescent tag. And see, I don't know if I can turn the lights down a bit, but so you can. So here we have the, um, the virus uh, uh, normally replicating in the, in, the, in the plant. But if we now take that P0 protein, that, sub, that protein that I was telling you, which will kill off the argonauts, and we, and we help this virus with, with some concentrated P0 and put it in just at the same time, the same virus, the same sort of leaf, then we'll get this dramatic uh, increase in fluorescence. And that's telling you that the plant basically cannot fight the virus off at all because you've expressed this killer that's killed off the argonauts. Hopefully that's much brighter than before. So, so that's the viral defense mechanism, but, um, and that's DICER 2, 3, and 4. But, but what's going on with, with DICER 1? This is a very different sort of a phenotype that we get compared to the others. Well, uh, and if we look at it, um, grow it up a bit, it really doesn't look much like a plant at all. It doesn't seem to have leaves and its flowers have gone all over the place. It does, it's very confused. And similarly, if we look at um, other mutants, a mutant of Argonaut, it looks bizarre. That's, this plant here is, is this one here compared to the wild type. So it's, it's a very confused plant. And all we've done is knock out this one Argonaut protein, or in this case, this plant here, we've knocked out this DICER1. And, and here's a different mutant of DICER1. It's just a mutant in a different place. 
and it is, uh, oh no, sorry, I'm telling you why, that's, that's another Argonaut 1 mutant. And uh, the reason I show you that is because this uh, Argonaut has become really quite famous in, in medical terms, uh, in, 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 in most molecular biology uh, and, and developmental biology around the world. Uh, and the term Argonaut came from the plant mutant that we found first, but there was a mutant uh, of the same gene, and it, was sh and it showed you this phenotype. And the guys that found it called this dandelion. And so I just show you this because it would have been rather nice if the medical profession was now talking about uh, their genes being regulated by dandelion rather than by argonaut. But um, uh, I don't think that. I think they'd have changed the name rather than stick with it. But anyway, here's the um, uh, what's going on is that that I've told you all about dices two, three, and four. Um, but what's what, what's dice one doing? Um, it turns out that. When we thought we were being very clever and we were designing uh, hairpins to trigger this viral defense pathway and kill off genes, that, that nature and evolution had been uh, way ahead of us by many, many millions of years, by, well, nearly billions of years. And that, they, uh, that cells of animals and plants are producing their own hairpins at their own time in such a way that, uh, that and this is what DICER-1 does, it comes along and cuts out just a 121 base uh, double-stranded RNA and loads it into Argonaut. And that this regulation, that you then uses it to regulate its own genes. And so that genes that are, uh, that this is so important uh, in regulation that if you uh, don't have an Argonaut to regulate your genes, you'll have completely, well, generally uh, dead animals, dead plants, and so on. You've got to, You've actually got to have point mutations in order to be uh, to survive. A complete null is is death. So this is just showing you what a real microRNA uh, hairpin looks like. It's I drew it just like like this here uh, with a 21, but in, in in truth they will look much more like this. This is uh, the start of the molecule, and it whoops, and it folds itself up into this amazing structure that looks more like a uh, an airport than a, a, a departure lounges and stuff than an RNA molecule. But this sequence here of about 21 bases, and I've zoomed in on it, this region, uh, is the only piece of the RNA that's going to be cut out, this blue strand and this red strand, to make this uh, 21 base piece, which is then, uh, oh, here comes the dicer, it cuts it out, and with this jagged ends, and then loads that into Argonaut, so there's your single um, strand there, to do the uh, scanning of all RNAs in the cell. And so what we find, find is that there's lots and lots of these RNAs in, uh, in, in animals and plants that they're called, uh, and they've been given this name, microRNA. And when you find a new one, you, ne you get the pleasure of, of, of giving it a number. And uh, so the, this, this, this one I showed you before ha is called microRNA 159. But um, there's a whole lot of different names. And how many, what's the sort of numbers of, of RNAs that we're talking about? Well, the, in Arabidopsis there are nearly 200, in humans there are about near, uh, 700. So there's quite a large number of these. Not huge because we've got something like 25,000 genes. Uh, so there's not one for every gene, but they tend to work in clusters. And they can control all kinds of different things. Um, so uh, in mammals, for example, uh, uh, involved in, in fat metabolism, in stress, in cancer, in development, you can take these um, Zebrafish is a nice model for, for human um, development or m uh, animal development. And so some people have taken just one of these microRNAs away and knocked it out in this, in this uh, zebrafish, and its brain just will not develop. It'll develop a body and no brain whatsoever. And then you add just back this, this one piece of 21 bases of RNA, and it will then make a brain. So just that one little tiny thing can have a, a massive impact on, on development. 
it, it, they're involved in cancers and stress and so on. Um, in, in plants, they're involved in development and floral identity and leaf shape, flowering time, etc., etc. And this is just a, uh, a, um, a diagram to show you that these are the numbers, these is just to, this, these are the numbers given to the different microRNAs, and these are the genes that they regulate. I wouldn't, you don't have to worry about what they are, they're actually sort of like master regulators themselves, but they regulate genes that have an impact that, say, that can change whether the leaf, the top side of the leaf is in the right place, and if you mess with it, it'll go the wrong way around, or it won't make a leaf at all, it'll make a cylinder, or the flowers. So here's one where we messed with this one, so instead of making a nice a flower with four petals, you change this 21, and your flower looks more like a camellia than, a, um, than an Arabidopsis plant. If you mess with this one, you, your leaves go all curly instead of straight. So these are very, very powerful molecules that are controlling our development. That it, it used to be thought that basically DNA was everything. DNA coded for your genes, it coded for the promoter, it, it regulated everything. And, it, um, and, it, and that, that was basically what, what led to the correct development. But this is showing us that there's a whole nother, a whole new layer of regulation, which is these small RNAs regulating the messenger RNAs. Just to give you a, an example, here's an example where we've messed with one of these. That here's your wild type plant. We've messed with just one of these. Uh, and in fact, we've actually overexpressed it. We've produced too much of it. And the plant, instead of growing normally, it forms this sort of cup-like structure. And it has no growing tip at all. It will just stay like that forever. And, uh, and just go no further. It's completely developmentally stopped. Or here's another one. This is um, quite in intrigued in this one in that uh, maybe you can see that this looks a bit like bok choy or, or celery, that this is not uh, what an Arabidopsis plant should look like. And so just simply by messing with one of these, you can change um, the, the structures of, of, of plants. And I guess it, it it offers the possibility of, of targeted, of, of, of really um, designing your own plants for the future. But now I just flip back a little bit to, um, to this virus story I was telling you about. And, and I told you that the virus at, made this P0 um, protein, which stopped the Argonauts, so it allowed the virus to develop. But this doesn't have uh, this is, is not without consequence because the microRNA is also going through Argonaut. So if the P0 is um, affecting, uh, is killing off these Argonauts, it's also going to have this Argonaut kill off so your microRNAs won't work. So if we take that protein and express it in a, in a plant, we again get really weird phenotypes. This is, these are all those plants that I've shown you are all Arabidopsis plants and they, 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 they shouldn't look like this at all. So that's just showing you some of the, I uh, hope that, that, that what's been recently discovered are these tiny little RNAs that are so powerful um, and that they're really a new area of, of research for, for therapy, but also for development and for understanding all, all kinds of, of different um, uh, developmental processes. But what I'd like to do is I'd like to um, finish you with a, uh, with some work that we've been doing that, that is just a bit different and we, we sort of, um, we're getting a handle on it but it, it's, a, it, it's um, not, a, full, not a, f a finished story. And what we wanted to do is to say, well, can you get a gene and you have it in a tissue over here and can you send a signal from somewhere completely different that will pass through the body, in this case of the plant, but maybe you could, so the idea is to, you can maybe do it from a for an animal as well, and you send this signal to a completely different part of the um, of, a, of a body, and then turn that gene off. So this is what we've been doing. We we, we take our Arabidopsis plant again. This is in the dark, shining a blue light on, so the leaves leaves look red. But we've now put in an extra gene on top, and it's a uh, this fluorescent protein gene again. So it, we shine the light on, we get this nice green color. But we've also taken plants, and 
we've put in the, this GFP gene here, so it should be fluorescing green, but we've also put in one of these hairpins against which will target the destruction of the GFP and, and its messenger RNA. So the idea is this gets chopped up into these 21s and then these 21s will kill off the, the RNA that codes for the GFP. So when you shine a light on, the GFP is gone. So now we do the, the experiment. And what we're doing is we're doing this grafting. We're taking a top part of a, of a plant which has got that GFP gene and the bottom part which has got, you don't even care about that, but it's got this hairpin in the bottom with these, which makes these small RNAs that should be targeting the GFP messenger RNA. And the question is, can these move through the body of the plant and kill off that gene up there? So this is our, um, uh, our setup. Here are these plants with the GFP gene and expressing it all over the place. And here with the hairpin, so it, the GFP is cut off. And what we're doing is we're cutting just this tiny little growing tip, which is called a meristem, and transferring this tip, and there's just a, a, a magnified version of the bit that we're cutting off, and then we're going to stick it on the root here. So this is our graft, that here's our nice fluorescent top part onto a, a root with a, a hairpin. And just to show you how small they are, that's a pinhead, so that we have to ha have uh, either have coffee or no coffee, depending on which of us is doing it, as to whether caffeine steadies our hands or makes it shaky. But you've got to be very careful about this. And when we do this graft, we've, here's three days after cutting them and sticking them together, it, it, it starts to join together. And then when it's, it's joined, the nutrients can go up the root and the plant can grow. So here we go. We'll see what happens. So, um, so first of all, this is a graft where we've got a, a GFP top on a GFP bottom. But this here, which hopefully will run, is our GFP on the top and the hairpin on the bottom, and saying, can it send a signal up the plant and kill off that, that uh, green gene? So as it grows, it would normally grow green all the time. But if we can send a signal up from the bottom into the new tissue, we will, if we can switch that gene off, it'll switch the, the green gene off and the leaves will look red. So you can see that um, we have actually succeeded in sending this signal from the bottom up to the top and a silencing a gene in a completely different region. And to, to look at this signal, we've, we've been um, um, damaging these plants. Uh, I've got a few minutes to go. Um, in that what we've done is we, we do the graft and no sooner have they started joining each other together than we chop their heads off again and say, well, if we can send a signal, will, um, uh, will the signal perpetuate? And here we've done it, uh, allow them to stick together for three days and, uh, and then chop it off and grow it on, on media and see if, it'll, if, this, if, if a signal gets through and silences. And it doesn't. But if you leave it for five days, that you, even though there's no root there, it's still able to send up a signal and the plant grows a bit funny, but it still continues to grow without a root. And you can see that the signal is going up and silencing that, that gene. So what's going on? Well, it's quite simple. It's actually the th it, three, days, three days, the plumbing of the plant is not connected. Here's our graft and this is, um, uh, if we zoom in, this is basically the plumbing of the plant, and it's not connected with this bit. But after seven days, you can see that the uh, top part of the, the pipework of the plant has found the bottom part and connected. So the signal is now able to go up from the bottom and into the top. And we can show this by adding a fluorescent dye. So these have been grafted for seven days. And so hopefully, this will work. Yeah. That we're now adding a dye on the bottom and saying, is this connected? And you can see that there's a bit of leakage here, but hopefully you will actually see that the, the, the dye is going through into the top parts of the plant. And so you, you can say that it, it's reconnected, whereas if you were to do it at three days, I won't let it go all the way, but it basically doesn't, won't go across because the connections are not there. So that's showing you that there are, the connections are, are 
are necessary for the ability to send that signal. And what might that signal be? Well, the idea had been that it might be one of these small RNAs and it might be the 24 base one. So we used the DICER 3 mutant, which is unable to make the 24s, but it would send the signal quite happily. And similarly, we had these different mutants of DICER 2 and 3 and 4, and we can actually put in the root, we can make the hairpin, but it's mutant for DICER 2, 3, and 4, so it's not making any 21s, 22s, or 24s. So then the GFP gene comes on, but the t it's still able to send the signal. So this is a bit of a confusion to us. We are able to generate a signal, but we can make it without these dices, and we don't know yet what that signal is. But the curious thing is that when I was showing you the, the um, sending up of the, uh, the fluorescent dye, uh, you, you can see it going through the veins, and you've got this, this pattern, of, a vein-like pattern. Whereas when I showed you the graft um, growing, it, it, the pattern is very different. So if it was going up through the veins and coming out, you might have imagined that you would get this sort of reciprocal type pattern. You'd get red veins on green leaves as the signal came out. But the answer is, is that this is leaf number seven that, that shows the silencing and not the previous leaves. And when we doing, are doing the grafts, and we're first putting them on, there are basically three or four or five little stumps of tiny little bits of leaf that are going to become leaves number one, two, three, and four, and five. And it's only after the time of about seven days, which is the time it takes for the joining of the connections and the signal to come up, that, um, that leaf number seven, the bump in this, this growing tip, which is a, which is a, we call a meristem, and it's, it's um, basically stem cells on the top of the plant that are dividing and uh, making the, the rest of the, making the new leaves and so on. And so it's actually leaf number seven that is responding to this uh, signal, whereas the previous leaves are not. And if we sort of do like an x-ray of the, of, the, of, the, of the tip of the plant, and this is where our stem cells are in the meristem, this is the plumbing that's coming up. And can you see here are pipes that are just ending just down, just below where the meristem is. So the signal's coming up this pipework and spreading into these stem cells here. And so what we think is going on is that this growing tip is, is or the meristem as we call it, is a, dem, is a dome like structure full of these, these stem cells which, which will divide and move to the side and then they will divide again to make a bump which will make the leaves. So what we think is happening is the signal is coming up the um, pipe work of the plant, the vasculature of the plant, and it's actually turning these cells, these genes off in the stem cells of that plant. So that when the leaf grows, it's not actually, uh, the silencing that we see is not actually the coming through the veins. The signal can only be perceived in these stem cells and it's the tissues that are made from those stem cells that then have the gene uh, killed off. So it's more of an inheritance of the silence state rather than the spread of the signal through the veins. So that's our, our model. Is here is it's this is looking down on our on our growing tip. This leaf is going to be form a leaf, and this was going to form a leaf. This is leaf. it's too late for them to because they they're already differentiated into into leaf-like structures. It's only the new bumps that are coming from the stem cells that can inherit that silenced stem. And now. Just about to finish off with is to say, well, um, uh, to, just to show you that we can send this signal and we can silence this gene, but in fact, nature is ahead of us and it can completely <coughs> reverse that for us. So what we do is we do the graft, we have the GFP in the top and we send the signal up from the root, but we can then actually uh, cut this off and let it grow its own roots and then grow on, um, uh, continue to grow without having had the rootstock sending the signal. So we sent a pulse of the signal and it grows up, it silenced the genes in all this tissue, including the seed, the, the flowers and so on. But when it sets seed, it completely reverses again and the GFP comes on, showing you that the gene that you've turned off 
by sending this signal works for that generation, but in the next generation, then the gene comes back on again. And what I'd like to do now is just, is just finish with showing you a, a, a movie of this um, uh, grafting again, and just to see if you think I'm telling you the truth about how it goes through and it just completely blocks out the leaf that appears is completely silenced and it's not, um, a vasc uh, uh, it's not showing a vein pattern. And to us, we, we, uh, we were amazed when we could do this. It really blew our minds. And so we've put a soundtrack on this and we may get a soundtrack that aids you with that. Yes, here we go. I'd just like to finish. Thank you.